Hi everyone, thank you guys for coming. I know Tuesday night can be a little <laughs> difficult. So, um, I'm Simon, by the way, and this is the Catalyst Interview Prep Course. And uh, we have the other instructors as well. Ashka's in the back, and then Gung is here as well, if you haven't met them. And then we have someone named Bobby as well, but he is not here right now. But, um, without further ado, we're going to be working on strings, arrays, pointers, and hashing. So this strings and arrays basically cover a lot of what prep interviews can really go over. Um, and like everything else is just a complicated, more ver more complicated version of using these things. So we'll go through a lot of practice problems. Um, so first and foremost, some basic quick tips to try to keep in mind. Um, one of the things that I found most helpful is trying to solve these problems without uh, programming in mind. Like how would you personally solve this problem? Um, and then trying to code it after you've recognized the pattern. So I'll sort of give you guys a lot of time when going through problems to try to do this yourself, um, as well as uh, obviously thoroughly test your program with uh, an algorithm with different edge cases. And one thing that I've also found helpful is to try to think about how fast you should be able to solve this problem and then shoot for that as a goal. This is like the idea of like a best conceivable runtime, right? So if you think this algorithm can be solved in like n log n time, shoot for something that seems like it should be n log n time or maybe even higher than that and try to make it so that you reach your what you think should be uh, your fastest algorithm. And then, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So one other thing that you should be able to do while you're coding for interview um, is make sure you can explain what you're writing. You don't want to be going through an algorithm and then the interview is just basically sitting there watching you write this algorithm. You want to be able to explain your thought process behind different lines, edge cases you're handling, um, why you're handling them a specific way and your thoughts as you go through it. And this is pretty good uh, meme to show you <laughs> um, what not to do. Um, and so basically we're going to go really quickly over basics of strings, arrays, and hashings. Um, so strings are immutable. One thing is that you don't want to append to strings using this way. So the way that he's doing it currently is to <coughs> declare a string and then basically doing an addition to each string. The reason you don't want to do this is because you'll be creating a new string object every single time. So this um, takes up a lot of unnecessary space, right? So if you have a string sentence that is empty and then you add the, the character A, now you have empty string plus a string with just A and then you'll have a string with A, B, and then a string with A, a string with a, an empty string. So you'll just have a lot of string objects and we'll use unnecessary space. You should be using a string builder, which I'll be using in a, a later example to make your strings. Um, so really quick thing, as well as um, if you want to compare strings, you got to use dot equals and not an equals equal. These are really basic things that lots of people forget. And you don't want to forget. Um, so one common string problem is palindromes. So everyone should probably know what a palindrome is. If you don't, here's some examples. And the, the basic definition of a, of a palindrome is a phrase that reads backwards and forwards. So one of my favorite uh, palindromes is a race car, right? <laughs> and so then uh, Madam, Nurses Run, and Taco Cat, as well as all you Tundura fans out there, Non is a, these are all good palindromes. Um, but think about how you would identify a palindrome programmatically, right? Um, anyone can think of anything really basic to, to try to think about how you would code for a palindrome? Anything at all. Brian. So first calculate the length string and then for half of it throw stuff into a stack um, and then just for the other half pop them and see if that if they the same words. Okay yeah that's one way of doing it so you're you're comparing um, one half the front half of the strings um, with the second half of the string uh, via stack popping and pop uh, adding so that's one way another there are lots of ways and you want to keep all these ways in mind they all have their pros and cons as well as for specific palindrome problems it may make much more sense to do a specific way of solving for a palindrome. And this will come in handy in the next question. But uh, so some basic ones is recursive. You know, you check the first and last character of a string, see if it's the same, and then you recurse um, without the first and last character, and you keep going. Um, this takes O of n time, but will take up a lot of space, uh, n squared space, because you basically have the string of size n, and then a size of n minus 2, and then n minus 4, and, and you're still going. Um, so going true, another solution is going true with the definition of a palindrome is to reverse a string and then see if the, the regular string and the reverse string is equal, right? Um, it takes over time because you have to obviously go through every single character when you use dot equals, um, as well as over in space because you have to make a copy of the string, right? 
And then um, one of the, the trustier solutions is you start, for example, through the outside. So you check the first and last character, and then you slowly decrease your indices towards the center. You make them, so you take the left, or I guess this is your left, increase your left indice and decrease your right indice until you go all the way to the middle checking for uh, equal characters, right? That will take over in time, obviously, to check for palindromes. You have to iterate through every single character, um, but you uh, need constant space because you're only really comparing two characters at a time and you have to store for the indice that you're at, right? Um, so similarly, if you go from the outside to check inwards, you can also go from the center and expand outwards. The only thing you might have to be careful careful of is when you're from the middle, whether or not you have odd, um, an odd length of string or an even length of string. For example, say you had um, non n a a n, right? Um, if you start from the center, well, it's a little difficult to choose a center, right? Because it's, it's even numbers. You have to start from both a's and expand outward as opposed to something um, that is odd lettered like uh, madam. You know, you can start from the d and then expand outward checking a and checking m. Right, so hopefully those those make sense. Um, so we'll show you the code for one really basic implementation of a of a palindrome. So this essentially goes from the outside and goes inward. So you want to make sure you pretty it's a pretty straightforward um, algorithm. Make sure you totally understand it. So you start your two pointers essentially. Um, these are your references to the characters inside the string. You have one in the very beginning at index zero and the one at the very last character, right? And so your your while while this loop holds true, what you want to do is you want to check the two characters that you're at are equal. Um, and if they're not equal, you know this is no longer a palindrome, and you can return false. If not, you want to keep going towards the center by increasing your left by one and decreasing your right by one, and you keep going um, until you either right equals left or right is greater than left. Um, and this is this uh, will give you the correct answer whether or not you have an uh, an odd or even uh, lettered string, right? Um, because if it is odd, uh, I'm pretty sure one will be greater than the other, and if it's even, they'll be equal, right? Breaking you out of that for loop, or sorry, that while loop. So yeah, that's a pretty straightforward solution that you guys should all be able to code um, if someone asks you to do that, right? Um, so this is a bit of a twist making a, here's a, now you know what a palindrome is, uh, but here's a more common problem that you'll see that's also a little bit more difficult. So you're trying to find the longest palindromic substring in a given string. So for example, if I gave you the string bananas, you want to find uh, the longest palindrome within that string that is contiguous. So for example, in bananas, right, if you go through um, and you find the longest substring that is a palindrome, it would be a n a n a, right? Um, and there's some other examples here. Try to think about how you would solve this personally. Like if someone came up to you and said, um, find the longest palindrome in this string, how would you try to solve it, right? And there's some good examples out here. Uh, try to think of yourself, right? And we'll give you a little bit of time to think about this. Uh, if anyone has a suggestion, you can just raise your hand and shout it out, or after some time, we'll go into um, how I think you should solve this. Any suggestions? Anyone have something that comes to mind? Brian? This would be inefficient, but you could iterate through the word and each character you treat it as if it's the center of the palindrome, the left center, the right center of palindrome, and then go outwards until. Yeah, actually, that is the way that I was about to say. And it sounds inefficient, but there are much more inefficient things. So one of like the brute force way to solve this would be to find all possible substrings and then check if any of them are palindromes and look for the longest one. So that is the brute way to solve this. But what Brian said was correct, um, and we'll go over some 
over how you would go to that solution and actually implementing that. So, right, and also this is the answer for the um, last string. So how would you do this Did it, uh, and then how you would code this process, right? And one thing you might want to consider is the difference between odd and evenly sized palindromes, right? So going with what Brian said, we're going to start by traversing the string. And at the very least, you know you have to traverse through the string. So this will be O of N, but it's slightly more complicated. And if you think about <coughs> the way that Brian said, that sounds almost like an, an N squared solution, right? And the worst case here, you're going checking every single string, um, the entire string for every single character, right? So let's sort of shoot for this, right? Um, so as you iterate through the different characters, right? I mean, you expand outward to find the longest palindrome, right? And then um, let's think about odd and even cases. For example, um, non b b non, right? If you if you treat um, if you do this process that Brian was saying, right? And you expand outwards, you really won't find the longest palindrome, which is the word, right? The word is the longest palindrome, so you would want to return this entire thing. But nowhere here, if you iterate through the character, will, will you be at the center? of a palindrome because the uh, an even number of characters of a palindrome doesn't really have a center Oops. right so how would you solve this problem right you can sort of um, skip the the even letter if the even letter is not or if yeah if the even character for example if you wanted to start at B if the next character is not the same as your character you already know you're not gonna get a palindrome so let me see if that um, if that doesn't make sense right so you're going from N A A N is you're iterating through the string. It doesn't really matter. So you start at B, right? Now this is where you really want to pay attention, right? So if you're trying to go and expand from B and you run into a B again, um, you want to handle all these cases for when you haven't when you're trying to look for an even palindrome, right? So you basically keep going until you find a different character than yourself. So if you run into a B you want to keep going until you no longer find a B, and that's when you should start expanding for your palindrome. So hopefully that makes sense. We're going to say it one more time. So if you're at a character, you want to keep on traversing through the string until you find a character that you're not at. Right. So you have two different pointers, um, one that's going along with the for loop, and the second one um, that is the first character that is not at your first pointer. Right. So, so you'll start at B, and then your next, uh, you know, character will be the N, and then you can go backwards and find another N, and you can expand outwards that way. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, uh, as we code through it, um, this will sort of make more sense. So right now we're just going to code through basically a pretty straightforward implementation of how you would do this. Um, right. So also we've had, we have some test cases just to make sure um, you know, we can test this solution and make sure we're right. Um, so how, if I was being interviewed, this is how I'd go about doing this. So some basic things that you're going to want to do, um, since we're iterating through the entire length of the string and the length of the string is pretty important, um, we're going to go ahead and make that our own variable, right? Um, right. And you're also want to keep track of the positions and the, the lowest and the highest part of your substring. Um, so you're going to want to store those as variables, right, int low and int high. Um, and then we'll, we'll sort of keep going through the, uh, the rest of the algorithm and see what else we need to do. So for, um, we definitely need to iterate through the entire length of the string. So let's do, let's start this for loop. Nope. Right. And so, um, where do we want to start our low and our high? As we iterate through this entire um, string, we're constantly changing our low and our high. So, at the very least, our low is going to start at wherever our i is. And then our high, for example, let's just start it at i, and then we'll see. So the first thing that we have to do um, is account for sort of these even uh, number of strings. So we want to find the first character where we're not at a repeating string. So I'm going to iterate through a high, 
through while loop and we want to make sure we're constantly staying within the string um, so we're gonna change our high and we want to make sure that we never go uh, below or we never go uh, above the end of the string to never find a character so we want to make sure this high keeps running um, at the very least until we pass the the maximum length of the string and we also want to keep going um, and make sure we're not messing up with our even letter character make sure we're still a palindrome right so um, we'll get this next character um, at this high and see see what it is right um, and what do we need to compare this character to? We need to compare it to the character that we're currently at, right? Um, if it's the same as our character as our low pointer, um, then we know that we should still be going, right? Um, so for for example, let's keep up with this uh, non BB non type of uh, palindrome that we were looking at. If our low starts at the first B, we want to keep going. Um, to make sure we count for all even numbered palin or even lettered palindromes, um, so this this makes sense, and we want to keep going um, by saying high plus plus. So we'll keep on going until the next character um, doesn't equal the the character that we first started at, right? Um, so let's just make sure we didn't make any errors with how we coded this. Okay, right. Um, and now we can test for palindrome essentially. Now we can expand our low and our high pointers um, until we don't have a palindrome. So how do we keep expanding? This is pretty similar to the loop that we had before, but now since we're expanding outwards, we have to make sure we stay within the bounds of, of the string as well. So one of the first things we gotta do, um, so we don't expand outward, is we wanna make sure that we stay within a reasonable limit of of the very bottom. So we'll check low minus one um, greater than or equal to zero. So we stay within a reasonable limit of the of the palindrome, um, as well as we want to make sure we don't keep going outward if we're going to expand higher than the length of the string. Right. Um, so this is how we sort of make sure that we're staying within the bounds of the string. Right. Um, Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, sure. Right, and then what else do we need to check for? We need to make sure that we're still currently at a palindrome. So the best way to do that is if we're expanding outwards, is to just check um, if our input at that character um, is equal to the input at that character. Right, and while that maintains true, we want to keep expanding outwards. So how do we expand outwards? We decrease our low and keep increasing our high, right? So this will keep on going um, until we hit a palindrome. So, but now we definitely need to keep track of the length of this palindrome, right? So let's just make sure we know what current length is. How would we calculate our current length? So we know the low and the high, um, so let's see, we, if our high, for example, is 2 and our low is 1, what is the length of that character? The character's length is 2, so that is ho, uh, high minus low plus 1, right? So that is our current length. Um, and we also want to make sure that we maintain um, sort of a max length. So what is the max length? Um, let's just say... Well, we'll just say our, our max length right now is zero, right, um, in the very beginning. So if our current length is greater than our max length, right, we want to uh, make sure, um, we, we want to store the answer, right? We need to store the answer as well as the max length, so let's just make a string answer and just say that it's whatever. So if our current length is greater than our, uh, our last length, we know our current answer 
um, to be the substring that we're currently at, right? And this be begins at low and high plus one. So let's just make sure this, this sort of makes sense, right? Um, we're iterating through every character and we're making sure that we start our low and our high pointer at different or at, at the same character and then expand outwards to check if the string is a palindrome, right? And as we're expanding to check if the string is a palindrome, um, we find its length, and if its length is higher than the last max length, we set our answer um, to the current substring that we're looking at. So this seems to make sense. And if we do this for the entire length of the array, we should be able to find the longest substring, right? And so at this point, let's just return answer. Um, right. So this seems to make sense. Um, let's test it. So we have... Um, we have some here. Well, let's go to these strings. So let's uh, check these strings and see what we predict the answer to be. So say the uh, string is I went ski ks not really right. So if we iterate through this, um, we can sort of see that we expect s k i i k s to be uh, the longest string. So let's just run it and see if that's what we get. And if we don't, then we know that we run into a problem, and then we need to go back and fix our algorithm. So at the very least, it runs, and we're getting uh, an error for these. So let's just actually return. Um, right. Uh, or we could probably sort of delete these, maybe. Actually, that'll be a problem. Okay. Um, let's just write in random answers right now just to make sure that we can get this entire thing running. Um, but if there are any questions uh, as to how we did this, um, any questions? So we see that we got the wrong answer. So let's just go back and see why we got the wrong answer, right? Um, so right now it seems like it's just going on the last, the last string, right? Um, for all of these, so that is that is definitely not right. So let's just go back and see how we would manually be doing this, um, right? So we have a string answer. We have our length that is equal to the input of the length, low, high, right? And we're setting our low equal to high. Um, ooh, let's just make sure that this, we don't want to errors with parentheses. So let's just see if that was it. What's up, Bobby? I have a question. Um, have you ever updated max length? Uh, that, is a good, that is a good question. Um, and the answer to that is no, I have not, right? So we need to set max length equal to current length um, if that, uh, if our current length was greater than that, right? Um, so let's see if that's the problem, right? And it seems like that's a problem, but we're also running into an error where we don't have the, we're, we're expanding one too far out in this, in this uh, substring that we're looking at. So as you can see, we got really close. We got the SKIIKS, but we expanded one too high. So what we want to check um, is we're expanding two out. So one way to fix this would be to go here um, and make sure that we're checking that the, the characters that we're expanding out towards are the characters that we really need. So let's try this again um, with that. And it seems like we're getting the right answer. So this this algorithm seems to work on all the test cases. So for a for all these a's, that should be the same for taco cat, um, and for random string that doesn't have uh, a max uh, length palindrome, that that it seems like an appropriate response. So another question that you might want to ask at this point um, to your interviewer is like, how do you want to handle spaces, for example, right? So if I had you know taco cat with the space, do I want to ignore spaces? These are all questions that you should be asking. Um, and whether you do them, ideally you should do them before, but 
um, as you run into problems, you want to make sure you fully understand the problem. Um, Brian? To what extent should you kind of like optimize your code even if it makes it maybe a little harder to write? For this example, like, what if we like say to our interviewer, I want the code to be able to expect that a lot of the inputs might just be power drum, the whole thing. So maybe I'll code it to start at the middle, and then like if the entire if we get to the end to go beyond that, and like we're still in power drum space and just return the whole thing new, not starting with the first letter and going through. So you're so you're essentially suggesting that we should start to check if the entire string is a power drum to begin with, or if you should start from the beginning. Or from the yeah, center. So start to check if the entire thing is a palindrome first by starting in the middle. Because you have to start somewhere. You mm -hmm. have to loop going from zero to yeah. the end. So yeah. you might as well start where it's most likely or more likely that they, the answer lies. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, remember what I said last lecture about how you, most of the time you're trying to make sure that worst case complexity doesn't fall beyond like a certain um, like certain upper threshold? Well, in this case, like most of the time you'd be checking for like worst case complexity. That is, you'd expect for a string to have like no palindrome whatsoever, rather than having like a palindrome that's the entire thing. Usually, you're going to be expecting something that's like worst case. If not, then your interviewer would say so, like pretty much immediately. They wouldn't expect you to be like, oh, well, most. Of the, they wouldn't expect you to know that most of the inputs are palindrome. Like, you should make that assumption. Yeah, and so at the end of the day, when you also. Um, solve a problem like that, you're not technically making the worst case scenario better anyway. Your runtime will stay about the same. Um, and it seems like if you try to do that problem like that, it may complicate things more. Um, this is very straightforward and it's very easy to think through compared to something like if you started through the middle, you could potentially have two for loops that iterate from the middle to, to the right because um, you have to start a palindrome at every, uh, at every character. Does that make sense why things could complicate that? Um, and at the end of the day, you're not really solving the problem any better for the worst case. Um, but those are things to ask your interviewer potentially, and just to say that if you are checking for specific worst case scenarios, um, that could that could be one way to to make uh, to, to look at the problem, right? So it seems like this algorithm has been pretty much solved. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, about space and time complexity. Those are all things that you want to um, talk about with your interviewer, just to make sure that. Um, either there's those little suboptimal tweaks or like a check for worst cases. So for example, the worst case for A, uh, the string of all A's, um, that is the worst case and the best case is when um, you have all individual characters and you don't really have to check for a palindrome. Um, so why is the worst case oven squared? Right, can anyone think of why? Or the current algorithm? Right, so the idea is if you're checking for a palindrome at every single character, but all of those characters that you expand for palindrome end up being the entire string, you're basically going through the entire string for every single character. <coughs> right. Um, obviously, it'll be a little bit, um, if you go through the first character, you can't really go all the way out. Um, but uh, in big O, um, this would be O of n squared because you're going through the entire string for every single character, right? And the best case is the best case because you don't really have to go very far to know that you're not at a palindrome. You just have to check your immediate characters and you already realize that you're not a palindrome and you can keep going. Um, and so space complexity, right? Um, if you include the input, which you usually don't with space complexity, depending on who you're asking, um, um, it's O of n. But to actually do this algorithm, you don't really need much extra space at all. You're essentially just storing indices as well as your, your max length, right? Um, and so you have O of 1 extra space, which is pretty, which is pretty good. Um, this is the most optimal solution in this case, right? And so um, next we'll talk a little bit about arrays and array lists. These are really basic uh, information, right? Um, arrays, you have to tell it what size, at least in Java, and can hold any object in primitives. Um, array lists cannot hold primitives like ints, uh, you know, booleans, um, or I guess bool. But um, other things to know, variable length, so you can uh, append to array list, but you can't really for array. So if you've hit the max limit on array, you're sort of out of luck. Um, to check for size, you do dot length on arrays, um, but you call a method dot size for array list. Um, and you should always know how to access and add to different arrays and array lists. So by arrays, you access by indices. Um, array lists, you can do by get, dot get by index, or you can just dot add um, 
for array lists, right? So we'll talk about a really, really common problem, um, which is merging two sorted arrays. So the spacing's a little bit off, but you can sort of understand the question, right? Um, and there's a couple reasons why this is important. This is really important for merge sort, which we will talk about later, as well as um, this is a problem that you sort of run into with linked lists as well, which we'll also talk about later, but we'll use this problem for arrays, right? So say you have two sorted arrays, how do you take those two arrays and create one array with all elements from both arrays and sort that, right? So here are two examples. Think about how you would do this um, if someone gave the problem to you and then try to think about how you could programmatically do this problem. All right, um, any suggestions? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly it, right? Um, and the reason <coughs> this this makes sense is you're when you think about sorted arrays, if you have a sorted input, you always want to try to use the fact that it's sorted. Oftentimes in interviews, they won't give you that much extra information, so any information that you can use, you probably will end up using, right? So this really capitalizes on the fact that you have a sorted array and that you don't constantly have to search through the entire one of the arrays to add the next the next input. And so this sort of goes around with this idea of pointers. You want to make sure you have different pointers at different areas of the array so you don't constantly have to keep going and repeating um, lookups into arrays. So we'll code this pretty quickly. Um, right, so for example, let's just say um, we know that the size of our answer array is, is going to be um, size of list one and size two, right? So you should probably also keep those as variables, right? Um, right, so this is sort of just what we're gonna do. Right, and so the new size array be size one plus size two. That we sort of know beforehand, so we can go in and and code for that, right? And so we're also um, probably going to need to keep track of where we are uh, in respect to both these in, uh, these arrays. So let's go ahead and make two pointers as well, right? And we'll start them at, at zero. So now we can sort of keep, start iterating through this array. So how long do we want to keep iterating through this array? So one thing we do know for sure um, is we want point one. Uh, to be less than size one, because if you're you don't want any index out of bounds exception, so let's just uh, make sure that we have this uh, sort of easy, straightforward check right now, right? Um, let's think about if there's any other condition. So it seems like uh, that's about it. That's really what you want to keep going towards, um, and so then let's see. What point? So what? How do we want to add to this array? Is we want to add by comparing the the pointer that we're currently at. So let's get um, the first or first pointer um, point one. So that's the first, and that's the second. Um, so these are the the first and second different integers that are different uh, arrays, right? So what do we want to do with these? We definitely want to compare them, um, but how do we want to compare them? So we want to add the smallest one first. So let's just say if first is less than second, right? Um, we, ooh, we also don't know where exactly we are. So we want to keep track of where we currently are, right? Um, 
I guess we could infer that from point one and point two. Uh, but we'll use current for now just because it's easier to think about. So we're currently at one, and what do we want this to be? So if the first one is less than the second one, we want to add the smaller uh, value to the array. So let's add first because we know it's smaller. Um, otherwise, um, either first is equal to second or second is greater. If they're equal, we don't really care. Um, at this point, at least, um, we're not conserving positions in an array, and we're also making a new array, so I don't think it matters too much. So let's just say um, that we're going to be equal to the second, because now we know the second is smaller uh, than the first in, in the else statement. So what else do we need to do? Um, right. So if we're doing this, we also want to make sure we're adding to different points. So how do we know we're changing the first one? So if the first one is smaller, we want to keep going on the first one. So we add to the first. We incre oh sorry, we increase our first pointer, right? Uh, yeah, G. Is that better? Also, we can close this. Okay. So if we know if we're adding the first one, we don't want to repeat, um, and so we increase the first pointer in the first array. Um, otherwise, we've gone forward in the second array, and we want to increase our progress in the second array. Um, so that makes sense. Um, also, we want to keep adding to different positions um, in 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 our answer array. So we're gonna want to keep increasing our current because we've added the next element into our array. Right, um, so that seems to make sense, right? So let's just see what happens, or if we return an answer right now, right? Um, let's just have our test. Um, let's look at our test merge, right? So if our array is, uh, if these are our two arrays, what do we expect the answer to be? So we expect it to be one, two, three, four, six, eight, right? So let's just see what happens. <coughs> So if we're running this, this is running down here somewhere, right? Okay, so we just got one, two, three, right? And we got a bunch of zeros. So that means we're just not getting to the other part of the array. And why is that, right? Um, what do you mean exactly about the current counter? Uh, well, we're implementing it once. We met with that array. Actually, no, it's not structured that way. I thought we were uh huh. Okay. So, so you said something about the current counters. Um, you're you're sort of on the right direction. It's it definitely has to do with our pointers, right? So let's look at this while loop. I, we're just obviously not iterating long enough. Um, so I think it's because so in our two arrays, they're two different sizes. So actually, we break out of one of yeah. Go go for it. Do you have a suggestion? So instead of doing a while loop, you did a for loop and iterated through the length of the entire answer array. Uh huh. Um, yeah, that's one way of doing it. The um, but when you do that, you have to make sure you're not going index out of bounds on your two input arrays, right? Well, yeah, you only have. Oh, Yeah. So I guess one way to solve this problem is if we if we solve if we go through one of the arrays already, right? Let's just go through both the arrays and add the rest of the elements, right? Because right now it seems like we finish the the one three array um, and break out of the while loop before we add the rest of the second array's elements. So let's uh, sort of do this. So for once we know where we've already gone through for both arrays, right? So we've gone through the first array up to point one, and we've gone through the second array up to point two, right? But we don't know if that's the end of the array, right? So let's just iterate through the rest of the two arrays. So let's see. So um, we could do this with a while loop as well. So let's just do while um, point one, 
is less than size one, right? Um, what do we want to do? We want to do answer at current is equal to list one at point one, right? Um, so what else do we want to do? We know we're iterating through current and we're also iterating through point one. So this will add the rest of the first array. And similarly, we want to do the same thing with the second array. So point two um, and less than size two, um, answer at current is equal to list two at current, or the, the point, a point two, um, iterate through current as well as iterate through point two. All right, so let's see if this solves our problem. Right, so this this seems to work, right, for this solution, um, and should work for pretty much all solutions. You should probably test for more than just one uh, input, but we'll do that. We'll just test with one for now. Um, so the I don't know who brought it up, but that was a really good point as to using a for loop um, instead of a while loop. That ends up working if your inputs are both the same size and you get lucky with the edge cases, um, so that you don't have to. Um, you won't have index out of bounds exceptions if you get lucky, but you want to keep in mind um, if you have two different inputs um, the differences in size and how that will affect your algorithm, right? Um, th that is a really silly mistake that you don't want to make is if you uh, get index out of bounds or you get sort of lucky in your own test case um, So when you make your algorithm you want to make sure that the test case that you're sort of basing your problem off of um, is pretty comprehensive long um, and you know you you handle for a lot of edge cases when you're creating the algorithm, um, so it makes your uh, overall testing process a lot easier once you've developed the algorithm, right? So that was um, done with merging. So we'll talk a little bit about hashing. Um, let's just make sure we do our time. Okay, so um, if you've gone through two hundred one, um, you'll know hash. You'll maybe you've heard a little bit about hash maps, and you'll know the basic about hash maps work. But here's Here's a little bit of a review. So essentially hash maps um, map unique keys to values. And these keys and values can be essentially whatever you want. Um, uh, for the most part, um, they'll usually be like integers uh, mapping to either lists of arrays or, or, or arrays or, or different, uh, you know, pretty basic data structures. Um, but they can be very complicated. You can have a map uh, that leads from an integer to a different map which leads to some other um, crazy stuff, but for this example, we'll do something pretty, pretty uh, basic, right? So the idea is that you have a hash function that returns uh, an integer, which is a hash value, right? So in this example, we're mapping um, sort of uh, keys, which are names, to entries of of phone numbers, right? So you, so what they do um, is you you take your input, your key, and you run it through a hash function that returns an integer, and this integer sort of corresponds um, to a bucket, right? And once you enter this bucket, um, you have access to some value of entries, right? Um, so for example, if you run your hash function on John Smith, you get a specific value. That value is 152, and then so you check the 152nd bucket, right? Um, and you see what is in that bucket, and then go through the rest of the bucket to see if any of them are John Smith. Right. So, for example, we'll go through Lisa Smith as well. So, you run the hash function on your Lisa Smith. Um, you you go to the first bucket, um, and you see the the entries at that bucket, and you see that Lisa Smith is there. Um, you match the key with the key value pair in the entry. Right. So now you know what you found. So the reason why this is so powerful is that you can have O of one lookup times as well as put times. Right. Because the idea of a hash function is that it's very easy to compute some sort of mathematical function. Um, that in this case, right, our hash function is pretty straightforward to solve and should be able to solve in like constant time. Um, and so using that uh, index, you basically find a bucket and you can find the values from there. And uh, in the worst case, if your hash function is terrible and you put everything in the same bucket, you have O of n, right? Because now you're basically iterating through all key value pairs that you have anyway. Um, and for, for most uh, algorithms and for interview prep, it's okay to assume that you have O of 1 lookup time um, unless explicitly told you don't. Um, and you will have, sometimes you will have collisions. So for example, John Smith and Sandra D both lead to the 152nd bucket, right? But that's okay because inside this bucket, you have different key value pairs. So right now you have John Smith and Sandra D both there. 
So if you're asking the map where is Sandra D, you'll, it'll look in the 150 second bucket and then it'll look through John Smith and Sandra D just to make sure um, it gets the value that you're looking for. Right. So any questions with hashing and hash maps? Real quick. Okay, cool. Um, and so why hash maps are awesome is that this O of 1 lookup time, right? So for example, if you're looking, uh, if you're iterating through an array to find the specific instance of a number, um, you have to iterate through the entire array. Um, if it's not sorted, you can use binary search. Or, or if it's sorted, you can use binary search. Um, but this is this lookup is very, very easily done with hash maps. And hash maps are often used to increase your time, right? So if you have some sort of like n squared or n cubed algorithm, um, you can usually reduce it by a factor of n um, if you're constantly doing lookups by um, introducing a hash maps. But hash maps may not be perfect for all situations. So for example, if you have a space um, boundary, hash maps take up a good amount of space and will usually add O of n space, right? Because you have to, you're generally going to add a lot of um, your input into this map. Um, so if you have constraints on space but not constraints on time, um, it may be easier um, to, to go through and search for entire arrays. Um, right. So this is this pros and cons to keep in mind when using hash maps. Um, so one of the most basic examples of using a hash map will look at isomorphic strings. Right. So the idea of isomorphic strings is um, you basically just have to say whether or not two strings are isomorphic. So what that means is that um, every single character in a string um, has one unique value that it leads to. Right. So let's talk about um, this first example, A, B, C, A and Z, B, X, Z. Right. So they're isomorphic because every character in the first string leads uh, uniquely to one character in the second string. Um, and this actually needs to hold true both ways. So every character in the second string holds exactly true for uh, holds exactly one value in the second string. So in this case, uh, A maps to Z, B maps to B, and Z maps to X. Right. Um, so here are two other examples. Uh, foo and bar. This returns false because O will map to A as well as O maps to R. So you know that that is not correct. That's not isomorphic. And then uh, paper and title return true because P maps to T, A to I, um, E to L, and R to E, right? So think about how you would solve this problem uh, by yourself um, if someone gave this to you. Think about how if you had really long strings and you couldn't memorize um, all the mappings yourself, right? That's, that's some way to introduce this idea of programming into this solution. It's how you would program this, right? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. So that's that's a pretty good answer, and let's let's try to code that. Um, so, we'll, all right. So we'll check through check through isomorphic strings. So one of the basic things you can do for isomorphic strings to make sure uh, it's really basic error checking is if they're not the same length, you already know they can't be isomorphic, right? So let's just um, uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. So let's just make sure we do that real quick. Uh, we can return false. Um, so that'll simplify a lot of problems. And if you're actually running this, uh, this sort of algorithm, this will easily return false for lots of um, dumb strings that you take as an input, right? Um, and so we also know that we want a map that maps from character to character, as suggested. So let's just create that. Um, we'll just call it mapping. Um, and we'll use a hash map, right? Um, so how do we want to do this? So now we know they're the same length. Um, so let's just iterate through the entire uh, sh one of the strings. So we know we have to do this, right? So we're gonna have two different characters. Um, so let's just make sure we have those um, to begin with. So we have the first character. With a second character, right? Um, so, really, there are a couple things that can happen, right? 
So one of the characters um, is a key, and that key leads to a value, or it doesn't lead to a value. Um, that is correct, right? Or there is not a key, um, but you need a value, or you need a key and there's not a value, right? Um, so let's let's think about this. So let's just break this down into two different things. So let's say if the mapping contains the key for the first one, right? Um, right, so if the mapping contains a key, then we definitely need the second character um to to be uh in in the map right that needs to be the value otherwise we know we're not correct so um or vice versa if we know the second is the value in the map then we know we're good right so let's say mapping dot get object this is the first one right so now this is the character that it should be right so if this character is equal to the second then we can continue right yeah, that makes sense because it's the character that you expect it to be. Um, if it's not, however, um, right, then we then we can return false because that means it's not isomorphic, right? We we have <coughs> one value that should already be mapped to a second value, but it's not, uh, and we we fought, we found an instance of the first character um, leading to a mapping that is not already there. So that that sort of makes sense, right? So let's handle the second case. Um, so if the first key is not already there, um, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to add this, right? So we're going to put this first character. Uh, so we're going to put the second character as a mapping to the first. All right. Um, and so if it gets all the way through and doesn't return false, then we know it's true. All right. Let's just see what happens. Um, this seems like it's pretty good. We haven't really tested too much for edge cases, but let's see what happens. So test isomorphic. Um, here are some test strings. Let's make sure everything's good. Um, <clears throat> right, so let's see what we expect these values to be. Let's just run it. Right, so AAG, VVC, that returns true, ADG, a, A, G. That should not be true, right? Because we're mapping an A to A and we're also mapping a D to A. So you don't have uniqueness. You're not preserving uniqueness. Right? So that's a problem. How do we solve this problem? Right? So so let's see what actually happens. Let's think about this, right? So we so we ran into A and we mapped it to a different A right here. This is the problem that we're looking at. Right. So we uh, saw A, mapped it to A, but we also saw D and we're mapping it to A again. So that's the problem. We never checked if it's already been mapped to, right? So the problem is if it's not already in the map, um, but maps.values.contains second, right? So that means, all right, let's just think about this. So this, this, this means that the second character has already had a mapping to it. Right. Yeah. So that 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 solved this problem. So let's let's run it again and see what happens. Right. Um, so it still remains true for the first one. All right. This is this is correct now. Right. So let's think about the other ones. A maps to T. V maps to D. V D S. V D V. Right. So that solved the problem. Oh. Uh, so here. Um, this is the exact opposite of the second one, right? So um, ADG and AAG, that returns false, and so does AAG and ADG, right? Um, but let's let's take out this line of code where we check for uniqueness, right? So this is what we had before, which is obviously false. Uh, it, was a, it was an incorrect statement. So when you think about what this mapping actually solved, it was like, ADJ and AAG return true, which was which was incorrect. But think about the other way around. AAG and ADJ return false, right? It's the same exact problem, but the way that we, um, the way that the string was ordered affected the outcome. So one way you could actually solve this is to using this this algorithm without checking for um, containing, but just running it on inputs that were switched, right? So now your your input one becomes your input two, and your input two becomes your input 
one, right? And if you return true for both of them, or if, you, if your values are, are the same for both of them, then you, you know you're correct. Um, or you could just add this line of code and it'll fix your problem. <laughs> but that that works, right? So that's that's isomorphic string. That's a really basic implementation of a hash map. Um, at its very core, it uses the fact that you have a value and a map, uh, or in a key that maps to that value, right? Um, so one of the most popular problems um, is two sum. I've actually run on this problem a lot, um, either through like basic coding challenges or it's just a very fundamental problem. So this is a really good one to pay attention to. Um, yeah. So given an array of integers and a target sum, find the number of pairs of integers in the array whose sum is equal to that target. So that's a lot of words, so let's look at some examples. So here's an array, right? And your target sum is two. How many different pairs can you get that equals six? So when you're looking at this problem, you can probably do it uh, in your own time. Like you can you can figure it out in your head. Uh, when you have a pretty long array, like the second example, it's a little bit more difficult to do in your head. So try to think about a way you can um, sort of automate this process, right? How do you make the, the way that you solve this problem make it procedural, right? Um, and, if, and we're also gonna take a break at this point because uh, we're about halfway through the lecture and I've been talking for quite some time. <laughs> so um, you can think about this problem as well as um, if you if this is too easy for you, think about how it's sorted and how, if, if the array was sorted, how would this change your solution, right? Does it at all affect the space and time complexity, um, right? Does it does it make coding it any easier? Um, just think about these two different, two similar uh, problems um, during the break, or you can not think about them, and we'll come to a solution in a second. All right, cool. So now that you guys have had some time to think about this problem, anyone want to give us a solution or some, even like the base case solution, like the most naive way to solve this? Anything you can think of? Any confident people in the audience? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly it. All right. So if you didn't hear what he said, um, don't worry. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, right. So the idea is that um, you try to find the complement of a given number, um, which is the target minus the current number that you're at. So if you iterate through the entire array, you know that the number that you're looking for, um, for in the rest of the array is the target minus the current value. So for example, if you started this loop at one for this uh, test array and your target is six, um, you know you're looking for a five. So you iterate through the rest of the array looking for a five, right? Um, and at worst case, you're looking through the entire rest of the array, which is O of N. And for every single character, or for every integer, you're looking the entire array. Um, so this is an O of N squared algorithm if you continue this sort of naive process. But if you know what you're doing with hash maps, you can actually turn this into an O of N problem um, using the fact that lookup times in a hash map is O of 1, right? Um, so we'll try to code this problem. Um, right. So the first thing that we're going to do, um, by the way, so we're, we definitely know we need a map, right? So we're going to be mapping from let's just say it's going to be an integer to another integer, right? Because we also have to keep track of the fact that uh, if there's multiple, um, here, let's go back to this example, right? If there's multiple values, for example, 10 and 10, right? And our target is one. If we have one, we have multiple ways to map this 10 and one pairing, right? So we're going to need to keep track of how many integers there are. So let's think about this for a second. Um, Let's make this hash map, right? Um, so every for every integer, we're probably going to want to add the number of times this integer occurs, right? So how do we sort of do this, right? Okay, so let's just go through pretty straightforward. So we're gonna need to ca keep track of the amount of total sums there are. All right, let's just start that at zero. And we also know that we're going to need a for loop that iterates through the entire thing. 
All right, so let's just make this straightforward right. And we're definitely going to want to return sums. Okay, so we have the basic sort of overall layout, and let's think about how we want to proceed, right? So we are also need to keep track of the complement, right? So we're looking for the complement. So let's just say complement equals, um, what is our complement? Our complement is going to be sum minus our current value. So let's just say int current is equal to input at i. Right, so let's say complement is equal to, com or yeah, sum minus, or no, sorry, not sum. Oh yeah, it is, let's just call this target. Um, or no, this is sums. Right, so we're going to take target minus the current. Um, Alright, so basically, we're looking for complements. So let's just say mapping.get complement. Right, so what is that? That's the number of complements that exist, right? And so if we have X amount of complements, we want to add our sum. We want to increase our sum by the number of complements that exist, right? So that, that makes sense. Um, what else? So right now our map is empty. After we've done that, we definitely want to add ourselves to the map. So let's do map.put. What are we going to add? Um, we definitely want to add ourselves. And, okay, we want to increase our number by one, right? So if we're already in the, in the map, so let's think about how we want to do this, right? So let's just say integer previous is equal to um, mapping.get or default current or zero. So if you've never run into get or default, essentially what this does is it'll get the value from the mapping if it exists right that's the whole get part of this get or default the get part is if it already exists give me that value but if it doesn't exist what do I want to do right I don't want to null I want a default value so it'll be get or default um, the current value or give me zero instead right if it doesn't already exist so so that simplifies things so what do we want to do we want to take previous and add one to it, right? Because if it already exists, then we know there's another instance of it. Um, but if it doesn't exist, we want to add one, right? So then we want to put in current, and we want to put in previous, uh, the new modified previous. So I think that makes sense. Let's let's test it. Uh, what are we on? Two sum. So let's see what it, exactly it's testing, right? So this is actually okay. Let's let's go with. The example that we know the answer to. Right, so let's see what it does. Um, so we're gonna null pointer exception, so let's see why. Right? Ooh, okay, so if it doesn't have a value, right? Um, so how do we do that? We can pretty much just check if mapping that contains key of the complement. Then we want to do this. Um, that should get rid of the null pointer. So essentially what it was doing is it was trying to get the value from a key that's not already there. Right. So we just obviously we can check it. We can just check if it exists or not. So let's see if that solves the problem. Right. So we have this array and we're target is six and we got two. So that seems to work for that case. Let's do something um, a little bit more complicated. This won't let me copy. So we're just going to. Um, here we're right here so let's just take this entire array copy it into um, to some and we'll see if this works right um, and if this doesn't work then we obviously have a problem because um, our, our first case was too specific so this will um, the reason why this is a good thing to do um, is because this has a lot of doubles in it um, or like repeats right you have multiple instances of 10 and 1 so the answer is 9 and the answer is nine. So we know we did a pretty good job, right? Because um, it ends up it ended up working for that. Um, so yeah, that that's a pretty straightforward solution for test for two sum. It's not that many lines of code. Yeah, Brian. If you have an even numbered target, what that means would this code take half of that target, and then because the inverse is that, pair it with itself, even though. 
Um, that's a good question. So the thing is, um, that that it, it would if there was more than one of yourself. Because you add yourself to the map after you've already checked if there's a complement. Right? Does that make sense? So if you have a three, you're looking for a three, um, but the map won't have a three in it already unless there's two threes. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? I can uh, highlight with an example. So let's say, um, here we're going to test two sum. So let's say our value is four, right? Um, this will, this should return zero and it does return zero, right? But let's say we add another two, this should now return one, right? So the reason it returns one, it doesn't double count the two is because you look for your complement before you add yourself to the map, right? Does that, does that make a little bit more sense? Okay, good. Uh, that, that's a good question, uh, and lots of naive solutions will, will run into that problem, but this uh, came with a robust solution, so we're good to solve that problem. Uh, uh, one thing we definitely don't check for is for nulls. If someone gives us a null, this is something that you'll have to ask your interviewer. Is like You always want to error check. Um, someone gives you a null input, you should just return whatever you want uh, an answer that they want you to do. So like if you get null, you return null. Uh, uh, those are some edge cases you want to test for. We didn't really cover those, but those are things to consider. Um, right, so now let's go on to uh, the big brother of two sum, which is three sum. So now the, the, this problem is uh, very, relatively similar. Now you have an array, um, but you return true if three numbers sum to zero, else return false. Um, right, so here's an example, and here are the... Uh, this isn't technically the solution, but it's it's the, uh, the two cases that do sum to, to zero. So you would return true in that in that case, um, right? Uh, so think about how you solve this, and then think about how you try to do it programmatically, right? And here's some things to consider um, or to think about if you need some help. We'll give it another minute or two to think about this. This is a pretty interesting problem, I thought. And if you haven't already thought about it, try using two sum to your advantage. Um, it's not the most efficient solution to use um, just raw two sum that we just coded, but think about how you could use this in this problem. Um, it'll definitely come up with a pretty good solution. Okay, so uh, another thing to think about is to try to do best conceivable runtime. So um, one way you could think of is to like iterate through the for loop or iterate through the array three different times, um, check all possible sums. If, it, if any of them equals zero, return true. Um, that would be an n cubed solution, right? But one thing that we did talk about is using maps, and this is after the maps. So you can probably get faster than n cubed using the idea of a map, right? Um, so how fast do you think you should be able to do this, right? Um, O of n seems a little ambitious. Um, I don't know if it's possible. n squared, um, you know, you're reducing a lot of lookups with n squared, so that, that seems like a good thing to shoot for. n log n, um, that's an interesting one. n log n is often used for sorting, right? So maybe if you sort this array first, that, that's your upper limit to n, n log n, maybe sorting would make it easier. I don't know, that's something to consider. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we're going to go and solve this problem in two ways. They're both um, very similar, um, but one is technically more efficient than the other. So the first one is uh, 
we're going to try reframing this into a two sum problem, right? So if you iterate through the array and find a pair of numbers that equals the negative of the current number using the rest of the array. So that sounds a bit of a mouthful, but here's an example, right? So if you're, if you start at one, right? Um, and you iterate through the one and you're trying to find zero, you're basically saying find a pair that makes a negative one with the rest of the array, right? Let me say that again. So if you're at one and you're trying to find two other numbers that equal zero, you're basically saying search through the rest of the array and look for a sum that equals to negative one. So you're reframing this problem from essentially three integers, a plus b plus c that equals to zero, to finding two numbers, a plus b that equals negative c, right? If that helped at all, if any of you are more variable inclined, then great. But if not, don't, don't worry too much about it, um, right? So how exactly does this work? And can we try to use our two-sum solution um, to write as little code as possible, right? Um, so that's the first thing we're going to do is we're going to basically redo two sum to help us solve three sum, right? Um, so we're going to, right, so first thing we're going to do is we're actually just going to, um, let's start with three sum and see exactly what we're going to have to do for three sum. So, <laughs> Um, the first thing that we want to do is we're definitely going to iterate through the loop, right? So let's just do that and see if that gets us where put dot length um, plus one, right? So our current is equal to input at i, right? Um, and if we probably get through here, I don't exactly know. Okay, so let's just think about this. So Assuming we find a, a, the number, the pair that we're looking for, right? So, right, so we're gonna be looking for negative of the current value. So let's say um, we have something that returns um, uh, basically the number that we're looking for through the rest of the array. So we want to give it the input. We want it to find the negative current, right? Um, so that way, if we have two other numbers that pair up to the negative of ourselves, if we sum all three of us together, that gives us zero. And we want to give it the entire array without ourselves, right? Because we don't want to double count ourselves um, or the, the, the current value that we're at, right? Um, so that's a start. Let's, let's think about how we would actually code two sum for three sum um, with this value. So let's just start off by copying our two sum implementation. Right, so the really, the only difference target, um, is that we want to avoid this index. How do we do that? We could pretty simply just say, if the current value is equal to avoid index, we can just sort of continue, right? That essentially avoids that specific index. So let's think about how this how the rest of this solution works, given that we have something like that that um, help us for this, right? Um, so basically, pair num will give me zero um, if no other number exists. So let's let's do that, right? So if pair pair num is equal to zero, we know that we haven't found anything for this specific number, right? So it doesn't really tell us anything. But if we know it doesn't equal zero. And we can just actually return true, right? So let's think about if this makes sense. And if we go through the entire array and we don't return true, we're, we're return false. So let's just think about this one more time to see if this makes sense. So we're going to iterate through the entire array. We're looking at each individual number, right? So if we're at a specific number, right, we need two other values that sum to the negative of our number, right? So that the sum of all three of our values equals zero, right? So we're going to look, we're going to give it our input array, we're going to look for the negative current, and we're going to avoid ourselves as to avoid double counting, right? Um, so if if there are any that exist, if there's any pair that exists a negative current, 
then we return true. Okay, so this seems to make sense. Um, so let's just see what we're testing. So we're actually testing um, this. So negative one, zero, one. So we know this returns true because we obviously found some pairs. So let's see what this does. Right. Um, so it returns true. That's pretty neat. So we know we've gotten at least that right. Um, so let's let's think about this solution right here, actually. Um, we'll copy this in um, and see what the answer should be. So since this is not too bad, we can do this ourselves. Actually, the first three numbers happen to return true because um, 1 plus 2 minus 3. So let's see. See again, this returns true. So let's think about somewhere where we should return false. All right, let's get rid of this negative three. But what about now, right? Um, or in fact, if we have all positive numbers, we can't really add to three. So this should definitely return false, right? Okay, that returns false. That's about as much testing as I'm gonna do on this. But um, so you can see that this works, right? Any, any questions as to how we figured this out? Um, the key was in framing three sum and two sum by looking for a specific number and the number that you need is a negative of the current number. I've said that like four times right now, but it's the most important thing to know about this, this problem, right? Any questions? Okay, cool. So there are actually two ways about going through this problem. So the first way is the one that I just mentioned using two sum. Another interesting way of looking at this problem is to actually sort this, right? So when you sort this array, um, you're basically going to be doing the same thing, except um, it, you're just revolving the sorting back to two sum, right? So this sort of goes back down to the problem of how do you solve two sum when it's sorted, right? Um, you actually end up, it ends up being O of N regardless, but something that makes it more efficient is that Say that your target sum is very low relative to the to the indices in your input, right? So for example, um, if this is my um, input, right? Uh, imagine that it's sorted, but I'm looking for something that sums to four. I have two numbers right here, um, five and nine. If, th if these are positive, right? I already know that I'm not gonna get to five and nine, right? So this, this tells me something about um, how far I need to go through the array to find an answer, right? In the worst case, you're going O of N anyway. You have to check through the entire array. But like, if you get pretty lucky with what number you're looking for, you don't actually have to go through the entire array, right? So it's a little difficult to get your mind around, um, but you'll end up actually still getting an O, and o of N squared solution. Um, but it might be a little bit faster because you're putting an upper bound um, as to where you can look for, for specific inputs. Right, if your if your array values are too high, um, or they're they're different compared to your target value, you can sort of stop your search early. Um, if that made sense, that's good. If not, um, you'll still be fine using this two sum three sum problem. The O of n squared is still um, technically the same. It'll just be in practice because uh, big O sort of avoids all the the lower constants. Like if you have O of n squared, um, O of n squared is for all intents and purposes, um, the same for n squared plus n or just n squared, right? That's something Bobby had talked about last time, um, but it is technically more efficient. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, does that make sense? Any questions? Yeah. So like, uh, why should you focus on optimizing this for, I guess, for like the average? Like in this case, if the average case is better, like maybe you end up optimizing Right, that's a good question. So. It, it sort of depends on the interview as well. So some questions, they'll say you have limited space or you have limited storage or you have um, some sort of constraints, right? Um, if you have constraints, you definitely want to worry about those more before you try optimizing. And I think something that I've always found helpful is that if you sort of build out the layout of your algorithm first um, and optimize later, um, once you have the, the solution ready, and you're coded and you're completely done and you have a bit of free time, then you can start worrying about optimizing for, for cases like this. Um, in, in this case, it doesn't really change your algorithm too much, right? And if you're optimizing, uh, you should try to go for that. Um, but it, it's sort of like a, if you have time for it, 
um, you definitely want to optimize um, or at least tell your interviewer this is what you would do if you're looking for, for these last second optimizations. Um, just to know that you've considered things like that. You always want to put everything out you have on the table for your interviewer to make them uh, at least know that you're thinking about the problem. Right? So hopefully that made sense. Right. Any other questions? That was a good question. Bobby. Yeah, so Simran, when I was on the internet, I found some solutions where like it also used a hash map, but basically what you did was you went through the array of the double for loop and you hashed every possible sum of like two elements together and then you check to see if like there was the negative of like that in a third pass loop. Why is that a worse solution? Um so essentially um, you're using a lot of space when it comes to that. So something like this, um, you're limited. So if you have every like pair in a hash map, you're immediately using like a lot of space because um, you have n squared space. Um, and for something like this, you're only going through the array um, one time and recreating your mapping. So this you're limited to O of n space. Um, so that's why I would say that that is a less optimal solution. Um, and that is one thing to always consider. You don't really talk too much about space complexity in uh, 201, but it is a real problem. Um, it's something to consider um, in uh, when you're actually interviewing. But yeah, that makes sense. Cool. All right, so some time complexity. Um, this is O of n squared. We reduce this much by a factor of n actually from the from the n cubed and the reason or f because we were able to use two sum and um, search for your complement in one pass through of the array um, and you're doing this for every single element in the array so that um, n f you're essentially running a double for loop um, which is n squared and the space complexity of this if you use the sorting method um, uh, if you do your sorting in uh, O of one space um, then it'll be O of n for sure um, because you still have to uh, iterate um, for the two sum and make your uh, to find your, your complement. You have to know about the information in the rest of the array, right? Um, cool, any questions? All right, so the next problem. This one's a bit of a doozy. Um, Right, so we're looking at the shortest substring with the characters of the original string. So, um, formally, if you're given a set of characters, um, it necessarily don't have to be unique, right? Um, I guess in the technical sense of set, but not, not for this example. Uh, and a string S, find the substring in S which contains all the characters in T, right? So, for example, if you're, if you're given the string, test string, and you're looking for uh, the characters i, g, you want to find the shortest substring in S that contains all the characters of T. So for example, in, in test string, right, if you have T, um, you have uh, i and g, where in here um, do you have a continuous substring? with the characters i and g in the shortest amount of characters. So this happens to be i and g in three characters. You can find both i and g. And this is a little bit harder, um, a, b, and c, because of the fact that um, all these are basically, there's a very limited number of characters in here, right? So think about how you solve this problem. If someone gave this to you, the, the bottom set, um, and think about the processes that you did um, and try to generalize your solution. All right, so I'll give you a bit of a bit of time to think about this.
this is actually a pretty tricky problem. Um, thinking of a solution, um, at the very least, if you if you can find a solution, is um, pretty cool. Um, if not, coding is actually a pretty big pain. Um, so for interest of time, we'll go pretty well depth into how to solve the problem. We won't actually code it, but we'll put up the solutions online um, for what I would code if I had more time. Then we'll talk about another problem. And if we have more time, we'll start um, coding this problem, right? So the idea is you iterate through the string and create a window, right? Where um, through this window, you you know uh, the information about what characters are in the array or in your in your window and what characters are not in your window, right? Um, and then once you have a window where all the characters that you need are inside the window, you remove all unnecessary characters to remove, um, to sort of make the sh the, your window shorter, right? And then you keep removing until you no longer have all the characters, and then you start expanding again from one side, right? Um, till you have all the characters, and you sort of rinse and repeat this process. Right until you have all the characters again, or until you've hit the end of the string. So hopefully that made sense. Um, let's see, okay. If not, we'll we'll sort of. I'm gonna say it again, and we're gonna be a little bit more concrete with an example, right? So for example, our our string that we're gonna look at is is this bottom example right here. So you're looking for a, b, and c, right? So let's just find the first substring that has the characters a, b, and c. Um, the most simplest way to do that is to, you know, just start from the beginning. So a Right? Do is it have all A, B, and C? No. So we're just gonna keep on going, and it actually happens till about right here, right? So now you have A, B, and C, right? Um, but this obviously isn't the right answer, considering the right answer is right below where I'm pointing. So let's think about how we would sort of continue this process, right? Um, you know, we could keep expanding, um, but there's really no point in continuing to expand at this point. So let's start a shorten. So let's just remove one character that we that we know. So let's get rid of the first one. So we're going to start sort of contracting. So let's get rid of the A, right? Um, so now we have D, O, B, E, and C, right? We're sort of here. And we're missing the character A. So let's start expanding again from the right side um, until we get another A, right? So now we have D, O, B, E, C. And we keep going, we keep going, we keep going until we have an A, right? So now we're from D to A, right? This is pretty long. We're pretty much the entire string, right? But we can do a lot to cut, right? So let's start from the left and keep cutting characters until we can't cut characters, right? So let's cut D. We can cut O. So let's see. Can we cut B, right? So we're all the way here, and we actually have two Bs. So we can afford to cut this B. So let's cut this B. We can cut this E. Um, so now we're at C, O. D, E, B, and A, right? This is a lot shorter, right? From from this C all the way to this A, right? We're doing a lot better. Um, so same similar thing, let's cut the first character again. So we'll cut C. So now we have O, D, E, B, and A, right? Um, and we're missing a C. So let's start to expand again until we find another C, right? And that just happens to be the last character. So now we're going from O, D, E, B, A, and C, right? I'm spanning a lot of letters, um, but hopefully that makes sense, right? Do I need to repeat anything up till now? Does this make sense? Cool, right? So now we're O, D, E, B, A, and C, right? Um, we have all the letters. We're also at the end of the string. So let's do as much as we can to cut down, right? So let's keep cutting down. Um, we can actually cut down all the way to B, A, and C before we lose all our letters. And we've also hit the end of the string at this point. Um, and it just so happens that, you know, that's where we're at. We ended at B, A, and C, and that's the shortest substring that we found at this point. So we return B, A, and C, right? Um, and then walking through that um, visually was a little difficult. Um, coding it can become a little bit of a pain because you... Um, can keep a track of things in your head, but it's difficult to try to make sure you handle all cases. As in, like, what if you're looking for your characters that have two A's? What if you're looking for A, A, B, C, right? How do you how do you make sure that you have um, you keep track of two A's and not just one, right? So the idea of this, how you would solve it, is you have a map, right? And you have this map that maps from a character to the number of integers that you want, right? 
So for A, B, and C, you would have a map of A that goes to 1, B that goes to 1, C that goes to 1. Because you want 1 A, 1 B, and 1 C. If you have two A's, that, that value would be 2, right? So the idea is <clears throat> you, keep, um, you keep iterating through this, this string, um, and for every character that you run into in the map that is in your window, you subtract 1, right? So right now your map is at A, B, and C all with values 1. And you keep going until you found all the values that you need to in your map, right? So you, you go from A all the way to C, and now all the values in your map are A, B, and C all with values 0. Does that make sense, right? As you go through this array, um, at the value in the map, you subtract 1. Um, and that's just sort of counter to um, what if there's duplicate characters in the string. And now you know pretty much where you're at, right? Um, and then once you've done that, you start from your left window, your left pointer at the window, and start taking off numbers, right? You start taking off characters, um, and you, and if those characters are in the map, then you add one as you delete them, because now you're searching for them again. Does that make sense? So if you're at A all the way to C, and you have all your characters, the mapping is all to zero, right? And you reduce this one, or you reduce the first character um, to get rid of A, you want to change your mapping to reflect that. So now in your A mapping, you map to one because you're looking for an A and you're looking for only one A, right? And then once you've removed um, that A, now you're in the searching mode again, essentially, right? And you keep searching until your, uh, your A is once again at zero, right? And you sort of rinse and repeat this process of expansion on the right and contraction on the left until you've essentially gone through the entire array. And you want to... Throughout that, there's a little bit of nuances, like you got to make sure you're storing the string, you want to make sure you're storing the length, um, you want to make sure you're at all times you have, um, you know how many characters you're looking for, things like that, that that make this code a little bit more complicated, but as long as I've gotten the general point across, um, that's a good thing to do, because it's a pretty difficult problem. Any questions as to how you would solve this? Um, as long as you guys have all gotten to the point where, if you were asked to complete this this, this question, you should be able to um, give or take a little bit of difficulty, which is always expected in interviews. They, the interviewers usually don't expect you to get uh, the problem down in the first try because they try to make it difficult and see how you would work through a problem that you've never seen before, right? Okay, cool. All right, so we have 15 more minutes, um, and we'll talk about this, this last problem, and then we'll um, probably try to code one of them or start coding somewhere. Um, so the, the problem is called the next largest uh, permutation, right? So the idea of permutation at this, uh, if you haven't seen it, is the, is the idea that you are, at least in this context, um, <clears throat> is you want to maintain all the characters that you have. Um, you want to maintain that just in potentially a different order. And what order we want it to be in is that the order of the integer that you create is greater than the integer that you started with. So that seems a little broad, but um, we'll make this a little bit more concrete. So given a number, whoa, uh, so given a number n, find the smallest number n that has the same set of digits as n and is greater than n, right? Let's repeat this again. Smallest number that has the same set of digits, but is greater than n, right? So example here is if you're given an n. Also, you should always ask for a lot of examples because they really highlight some trends that you could see. Uh, I made these examples pretty pretty nice, so they highlighted some of the more uh, prominent and uh, important trends. But an interview might not necessarily give you pretty good examples that highlight these trends, right? Um, so if, if your n is one and your number is one, two, three, four, right? If I want to find the same set of digits that is greater then one, two, three, four. Um, but it is the smallest number greater than one, two, three, four. Right? So this is what are some properties about this number, right? So if you go from the right to the left, all these letter or these numbers are decreasing, right? It goes from the left, or sorry, from your from your right, four, three, two, one, right? If you're trying to find the smallest number greater than something, the first positions you should be looking at are the ones places, the tens places. You should be looking from the smallest power of 10 um, if you want the smallest number greater than, than the number you're currently at. That's pretty important, right? Does that make sense, right? If you're trying to find 
a bigger number. Obviously, you can find a bigger number than um, 1,234 just by throwing a 4 in the beginning, right? You're all automatically at 4,000. But the, the important thing is you want the smallest number that is greater than the current number, right? And the best way to do that is to affect the smallest um, sort of digits, right? So in this case, you end up having to just switch the 4 and the 3, right? So now you're at 12, 1,243 that is the smallest number that you can get that is greater than 1,234, right? That's fine. So let's give the basically exact opposite of this number, 4,321, right? Um, contrary to the last one, your numbers are only getting bigger. If you start from the ones place, you're only getting bigger. So if you wanted to find a number greater than 4,321, you can't with those set of digits, right? Um, yeah, there's really nothing you can do. Right, um, and this is related to the fact that your numbers are an increasing magnitude from the right to the left. Right. So now, what about an actual number that is in a special case? Right. So, um, two one eight seven six five. Right. What are you supposed to do from that? So keeping the things that we've said in mind about going from the very right and looking for some specific number that is either greater or less than the most right number. Think about how you would solve this. Right. Think about the sort of patterns that you may recognize in this and give you a couple seconds or a minute or two to try to figure out sort of pattern maybe Yeah, Brian? If you start at the ones place, look at that number, and then go to the left by each number until you find something that's smaller. And if you do, swap them, and you're done. If you, I think. If you don't find anything that's smaller, so every number to the left of the ones place is bigger, go to the tens place, and then do the same thing. OK, that's, a, that's an interesting solution. So let's, let's just try it on, on this first case, right? So you're saying. You start at the ones place, which in this case is a five, right? Um, so basically, you're going left until you find something lower than five. That happens at this one. So you're saying swap the one and the five? Yes. And right. I think actually after that, you have to sort the numbers to the right of the, where you begin the swap to be in lowest and highest order. Okay. Um, let's think about how this problem did it so that that seems to so if I swap five and one right and then I have eight seven six one and if I sort those in a form and add that okay that seems to work for this case so um you had something to say I think uh, wait. No, 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 no. but it kind of reminds you right now it's looking like this one of the sorting algorithms there's like a sorting algorithm yeah the way the swaps work I mean similar. I was thinking of Okay, so, so it seems like there's some sort of idea of sorting. Um, maybe that comes across specifically in this case. Um, let's look at this this next slide, um, right? So we talked a little bit about um, sort of patterns that you could see. Here's another test case and see if what we had sort of decided beforehand holds, right? Right, so we're going by what I think your algorithm suggests, right? We're looking at six. We want a number shorter than six, right? <clears throat> um, so like you're suggesting we switch six and four and then sort the rest of them. So you would have nine, seven, four, right? And this goes from four, seven, nine, right? So this, um, right, that, that seems to work as, as it's going increasing order, right? Yeah, so, so let's, let's try to do something. Um, let's try to code this, right? Um, we're running pretty close to short on time. Um, 
I guess a pretty quick poll. Who would rather see next largest code in? Who would rather start shortest substring? Is anyone shortest substring? Anyone favorites the shortest substring? Nope. All right. So we'll go with the next largest right now. Okay. So, um, so assuming we get all the characters um, as digits, right? You said our, all our answers depend on the ones place, right? So we're going to want to keep track of um, sort of the right Right, so, so the rightmost um, character, well, int right. And this will be at the index of digits.length minus one. So the next one, um, most left of that, is digits.length minus two. Right, and so what you're essentially saying is you want to keep having the left one um, going down until it is less than the first one. So let's just. Um, sort of do that real quick, right? Um, let's do a while loop, um, while low. So one thing we want to do is we make sure that we never get out of the the indices and digits. So let's say while this is greater than zero, what is the other condition that we want to do? Um, right, that's related to digits dot at the low is so we want it if it's lower than so let's just keep going while it's higher than or sorry we'll do this at um, say left left and this is right sorry. Um, so while this is true we want to keep going left and subtracting right um, so this sort of makes sense. So now once we've broken out of this loop, we know that the left digit is um, lower than or equal to. And since this is a set, we don't have to worry about the case where it's equal to. Um, right. So we're actually going to do the right. So we, so we know that the, the one on the left is um, lower than the one on the right. Um, so we basically know that. Um, but what, what if we keep going to the left? So we want to, so this is what we'll know if we are not possible, right? So if we had the largest, um, if we had something in that was in increasing order from right to left, we'll know because the left will be less than or equal to zero, right? Yeah, that, that should make sense. Um, so let's just return not possible. Does that make sense? So if we if we keep if we keep going to the left until we find something less than us, um, or, yeah, and that and that's and we don't find something that means we've probably gone too far and we've broken this first condition, and that's when we know that we want to return not possible, right? Um, so let's think about what we have to do now. So one thing we have to do definitely um, is we've noticed in these problems. Right, the first like, the first digits up to the lowest number don't really change, right? So for example, compared five to one, this two doesn't really get affected. So that's probably gonna stay in the same spot. Same with here, um, the the real connection happens between the six and the four in this case, and the five three remain pretty constant. So at the very least, we know the the string that we're returning um, will have those those digits, right? So let's iterate all the way up to the leftmost thing, right? So int i equals zero, um, i less than. So we know the very right, right? So we know the location of, in this example, we know the location of the four, right? So while i is less than left, right? That's, that, that would make sense. Um, right, and we also know we're going to probably be building a string. So let's get a string builder um, here. Oops. Right. Um, so this makes sense. So let's. Um, we're going to be adding the digits at i. So this will add. So let's just return sb dot two string. 
So let's just see sort of what this does for now. So these are our test cases right here, um, all the ones that we've seen previously. Let's see what it does. Right. Um, so one, two, three, four, returns one, two, returns not possible, which is good. Um, for here, it returns two, five, three. So we've coded that part um, pretty good for now. We know that for sure. So what comes afterward, right? Um, so let's make sure we find, okay. So here, um, it takes in the rest of the numbers and puts them in sorting order, right? And then returns them, let's bring this back up. Right, so let's just think about exactly what this does. There are actually, right, so we have, we've added the six and then we have four, nine, um, and seven. So why does it make sense that we put them in sorted order, right? So we want the smallest number that is bigger, right? So it makes sense that we put them, we put the largest number in the place that has, that has the smallest weight. So we want the nine in the one spot and the seven in the 10 spot and the four in the one spot because that gives us the next smallest number giving that subset, right? So that, that sort of makes sense. So let's just think about, um, how we would do this also so we're running pretty much close to the end of time uh, not the end of time but like the end of the a lot of time for this for this class right um, and the rest seems pretty pretty straightforward right because you're essentially going to be um, putting in the rest of the characters at the, at the end of the string um, so I think we should probably actually call it good for today how does that sound with everyone Cool. Any any questions as to how you'd want to do the rest of this? Um, you can either talk to me right now and all these. Yeah, G. I have a comment. Um, so, I, yeah, know how to do the two sums one. That yeah, that's for a lot of like screen like coding challenges on like Hacker Rank or whatever. That's when they'll be asking you a lot of the, like the textbook questions that you will always run into. At least all the like coding challenges that I've gotten um, that aren't like actual interviews with an interviewer looking at you solving the problem. They're pretty straightforward, um, and you should always be getting all of them right because that's like their sort of like initial weed out before they spend more time recruiting with you. Um, and these are the type of problems that you'd run into on like the the uh, Twitter is a common one or like. Um, any other, uh, Coinbase sends a lot of coin, uh, uh, tons of hacker ring challenges, but, um, yeah, that was a good point. Yeah, and I've run into the two sum problem like three or four times, actually. So, it's a pretty, pretty easy, easy point type of thing to get. Awesome. Right.